Uh, thank you, Dave and Matiba Menzies and Andrew for hosting us. Um, Constantine, it's a privilege. And just to, you know, the elephant in the room, there is a baby in here. Uh, it's my son, so uh, he's a big fan of uh, trigonometry in the podcast, so I want to make sure he was here. Um, Constantine, such a privilege to have you here. We were um, chatting to the backstage a bit earlier about, you know, the uniqueness of Australia and the fact that we are a Western nation right in the heart of Asia. And, and that is a bit of a novelty, it's something we don't consider quite a lot. What, is, what, is it, what does it mean to be Western? What, what does that mean to you and why is that such an important concept, do you think? Mm. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's my first time in Australia uh, and uh, I'm so honoured uh, that you're having me here. So thank you for the invitation and for, for making this happen. Um, I actually didn't know what to expect. So um, when I meet Aussies in the UK who are coming over, I sometimes feel like you guys are, you know, those Japanese soldiers? stuck on the islands after the war's over, <laughs> clinging to, to, the, to the cause when the, the rest of the world is crumbling. Uh, I, and, but now that I've been here for a few days, I can see why, because actually I think you're in a very good place compared to the rest of the West, and we can maybe talk about that a little bit. Uh, but it just <laughs> one data point, uh, that um, I was on the flight over and a guy recognized me and uh, came over and we started talking and he found out that I'm speaking various places in Australia. And he said, well, mate, watch out. There's a lot of you know, political correctness has got really, really bad. I thought, okay, fine. Uh, and then I get to my hotel, they're checking me in, and the lady hands me the card and goes, and if you want breakfast, head over to the two fat Indians. <laughs> I thought, this is my kind of place. <laughs> uh, so, you know, but that isn't the only one. I think you are in a healthier place. Now, the, the question about the West is interesting to me because this is something that I often say, you know, I claim zero expertise. As you said, I was a stand-up comedian, uh, then I started a YouTube show, really, because I was like, why is no one saying the obvious thing that we all feel? Um, and so I claim no expertise, but people keep asking my opinion, so I keep giving it. And it seems to me that if you wanted to not only define what the West is, but actually showcase why our civilization is special and unique, there is no better experiment that you can conduct than what the British did here, right? You take a few thousand of, how can I put it diplomatically, your least law-abiding citizens, <laughs> right? Gather them up, send them over to a, a continent, an island very, very far away with a harsh climate full of venomous creatures, and then you let them crack on with it for a couple of centuries, and you come back and see what happens. And when you come and see what happens, I think you have to acknowledge that it's a thriving society and a thriving country. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, we could be boring and talk about GDP numbers and polling data and whatever. But I think there's a much easier way of looking at this, is how many Australians are gathering their family, getting on rickety boats and braving shark-infested waters in search of a better life elsewhere? And how many people are doing the opposite to come here in search of a better life? And this is an experiment that's playing out over the entire Western world at the moment, which is, Millions of people are crossing the southern border of the United States, braving, dealing with brutal Mexican cartels. Thousands, tens of thousands are getting on small boats and crossing the English Channel, and we can go on and on and on. Uh, why is that? And the problem, I think, with the Western world that we're increasingly seeing is nobody is willing to articulate the answer in public. And I'm going to say something very controversial here, Jared, but the reason people are risking their lives to come here is that our societies are better. Sorry, I know it's offensive, but, but they are. And I don't mean that we are superior in the sense that we have a higher moral worth than people elsewhere. That's not what I'm saying. What I mean is our societies are better at producing the things that people seem to want. Okay? Now, if you watch too many Hollywood movies, you'd be like, well, yeah, what, what people are coming for is freedom and democracy. That's not why they're coming. They're coming because our societies produce safety and prosperity, you know, the ability to choose your gender. The, these things that people value uh, so much. Uh, and why are we better at producing safety and prosperity? What, why are we? Why are we? Why? Why? Well, well this, is, this is the problem, right? Because the answer to this question, it shouldn't take an immigrant like me to be articulating these things. You guys should have the answer at the, at the tip of your tongue the moment that question is asked. And the reason the Western society is experiencing this cultural malaise is precisely because these ideas are not being articulated, which is why we say all these stupid words like freedom and democracy, because we don't know how to explain the extraordinary success that we've had today. Okay? So what are the, the pillars of our success? Well, the first one is government by consent. Yep. 
right? This is not something that exists in almost anywhere else in the world. Um, it's something that uh, I actually asked Jordan Peterson at one point, and he went into a 20-minute lecture about chimps, <laughs> which, uh, which for the first 18 minutes you're going to have no idea what you're talking about, Jordan, and then right at the end it all starts to make sense. And his basic point was that in the chimp troop, there are two strategies for how to, to be the alpha male. The first one is you dominate through force, and the moment you cease to be the most powerful, physically dominant specimen in, the, in that troop, you're going to lose power. Um, the other is, effectively, you, know, you groom the other members of you know, mutual grooming, you, you build coalition of consent. And I'm not just talking about what happens in this building, about government and politics by consent. This, something, this is something that works down to the level of Western armies have been fighting better with smaller numbers and been able to, to beat others. Not, and one of the reasons is, I mean, there are many reasons you'll come to, but one of them is that the soldier on the ground has a much better ability to pass information up the chain of command, right? So at every level of our society, we are better able to do the things that we want to do because we have feedback mechanisms that let make sure that the people in charge do not disappear up their own asses. And it's very important that we have that ability to do that. And I'm not just talking about politics. It applies at every level. Um, one of the reasons Vladimir Putin felt so comfortable to invade Ukraine was that he kept being told what he wanted to hear, which is the Ukrainians are going to welcome your troops with bread and salt, they're not going to fight. And he found out what happens when you've been in power for 25 years and nobody's willing to challenge your authority, nobody's willing to keep you in reality. Um, so that reality check that we are able to get in various institutions is the first principle. The second principle is something that I think is uh, quite obvious and I've become, you know, people who don't like me call me right wing for saying that freedom of speech is important. And I remember a time about three days ago when freedom of speech was a universal constant value of Western civilization that we all understood as important. Um, and why is freedom of speech important? Again, we've lost the ability to articulate this, but you've got to understand that the scientific and technological dominance, absolute dominance in the history of the world that we enjoy in the West is a product of the freedom to research and the freedom to speak our minds. And why is speaking so important? Because you can't think without speaking. So when people try to shut down your speech, what they're really trying to do is to control your thoughts. And it's the freedom to research and to think out loud for ourselves, comparatively, comparative freedom, the freedom from uh, both government and societal and religious dogma that is the base, you know, this why the technological and scientific progress we've made uh, has been so comparatively amazing. I mean, Hernan Cortez arrives in Central America with 600 conquistadors and destroys an empire of six million people in a matter of years. Why? Well, one of the reasons is, of course, the technological superiority that he enjoyed. And this continues through the ages. I mean, I was born in the Soviet Union. Uh, how many of you seen Oppenheimer, the movie that came out this year? It's a movie about the Manhattan Project. Um, and, of course, because it's made in Hollywood, they, they made it all about the Red Scare and how poor communists were being persecuted. Um, and then right at the end, they slip, out, slip in the fact that uh, the reason that the Soviet Union developed a nuclear weapon is because communists in the West gave it to them, right? So the first nuclear weapon that the Soviet Union built was called RDS-1, which stand, uh, RDS stands for Russia Dilet Sama, which means Russia makes it by itself, which is ironic given that it was basically a carbon copy of an American nuclear bomb. Uh, and that technological superiority has been a consistent feature of the West's dominance around the world. And it comes from our ability to think comparatively freely and to research comparatively freely. But I'm not suggesting, by the way, that the West has some kind of monopoly on genius and ingenuity and creativity. But this is where the third component, the third pillar of our success comes in, which is private property and the rule of law, what we call capitalism, right? Uh, and that is because, look at, I mean, gunpowder is invented in China, but it's largely unused. And every single, almost every single invention in terms of firepower since, from the musket to the automatic rifle to the cruise missile is made in the West. Right? Why is that? It's because we have an incentive structure that means that you get to keep what you create. And people in the West do not realize how mind-bogglingly rare this is. The richest man in Russia at one point was a guy called Mikhail Khodorkovsky. 
He gives some money to an opposition party. He's no longer the richest man in Russia. And he spends the next 10 years in prison. Jack Ma is a Chinese billionaire, sixth richest man in China, right? Says some things about banking regulations, disappears for a few days and seems like a very different character since. Uh, Bao Fan, another guy, Chinese billionaire, right? Disappears a year ago, turns up a few weeks ago, and uh, just magically resigns all his positions. And in a society in which you do not get to keep what you make, the incentive is not to innovate, the incentive is to comply. And it creates a tyranny of thought from which a society is not going to recover in the same way. So the innovation that we have in the West is a product of the fact that the, the you, you have an incentive structure that rewards creativity, that rewards innovation. And in our societies, how do you get rich? How do you accumulate capital? Well, you do it by creating or providing things that are of value to your fellow citizens. This is not the case in a communist society. It's not the case in just a bare, normal corrupt society in much of the rest of the world. In, in Soviet Russia, where I grew up, the way you got ahead wasn't to create and produce things of value to your fellow citizens. It was about servicing the regime or servicing the people who are servicing the regime. So the perverse incentive structure of the societies is why they don't advance at the level that we do. So that is why we're successful. And we have had two, maybe three generations of people who've not been taught this, which is why when I say, what is the West, no one can answer. And we're embarrassed to say that we are better at making things that draw people to our societies. And that is, I think, the root of the cultural malaise that much of the West has gone through. Well, it's interesting um, you articulate you know, the importance of coalition building um, and, and this shared sense of cohesiveness, freedom of speech, and then uh, the lack of disincentives uh, to innovation and dynamism. Um, Australia uh, experienced a referendum here um, late last year, um, which divided the country along the lines of race and identity. Um, but we're seeing that phenomenon play out across the UK. We're seeing it play out across the US. Um, and I heard it described in the UK as Australia's Brexit moment when, you know, common sense, normal everyday Aussies said, no, actually, we don't want to be divided in this way. Um, we'd love your insight on, you know, why, how have we lost this sense of camaraderie, this sense of unity, of coalition building, and why, not just in Australia, but across the world, we're becoming obsessed with race, identity, sexuality, these other issues of division, rather than finding coalition and, and unity? Well, people don't like hearing this, but... It's Marxism, right? What this is, is Marxism. Now, people think that I'm using that word as an insult. I'm not. What is Marxism? Marxism is the idea that there is an oppressor group and an oppressed group, right? And when it was created, the oppressor group were the capitalist bourgeois and the oppressed were the workers and the farmers and the peasants. And the Soviet Union said, you know, what you need to do to create the perfect harmonious society is you take the oppressors and you take the oppressed and you reverse the dynamic. So the oppressors become the oppressed and the, the, the people who were being oppressed become the people in charge. And what happened was, I mean, the Soviet experiment <laughs> kind of demonstrated the flaws of that society, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and so what people, uh, Marxists in the West, realized in the 60s onwards that <coughs> this isn't going to work in the West. The, the Western working class were not going to overthrow the regime that was in place. You know, I always say this about America, you can't tax rich people in America because every American thinks he's going to be rich one day, right? And the, there's this aspirational culture that means that working people don't want to destroy the system. They quite like it. Now, they'd like to be protected from exploitation. They'd like more rights. They'd like a bigger slice of the pie, all of that. But they don't want to be overthrowing the system. So if you are a Marxist, what do you do? Well, you, you go to the thing that works much better at dividing people, which is race, for which we're race, tribe, ethnicity, for which we're pre-programmed. We're pre-programmed pre to see ourselves as tribal and to behave in tribal ways. And so they go into the universities and they spread this, uh, this ideology and everyone else kind of turns a blind eye because we're having a great time of it. Uh, but now those chickens are coming home to roost. And, and so this oppressed, oppressive dynamic, I know it seems, you know, weird and theoretical, but if you're asking yourself the question, how is it possible that in the wake of a terrorist attack on Israel in which over a thousand civilians are killed, massacred, raped, etc., you've got protests in the streets of your cities supporting the people who did it, this is why. Because once you create the idea that people who are successful are oppressors, 
then anything is justified in overturning that oppression. And the Jews, the Israelis, however you want to look at it, you know, they are a minority that does well, therefore they're their oppressors. And so overthrowing that oppression uh, is justified by any means necessary. So it's the oppressor-oppressed dynamic introduced by people who hate this society and who hate the civilization. And I make absolutely no bones about saying this. Of course, a lot of well-meaning people get drawn into it, but the people behind this are enemies. They're the enemies of Western civilization, and they're trying to destroy it from the inside. Um, you speak about the enemies from Western civilization on the inside, um, and one of the things that we're really uh, 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 conscious of at Page Research Centre is um, regional policy and rural policy. And with Australia's integration of our regional economy, that means agriculture, commodities, resources, exports. And one of the things that we've been struck by the trend over the next 18 months is the way the world is splitting into a block with expensive energy and a block with cheap energy. And uh, the area of the Ukraine that Vladimir Putin now controls is worth about 12, 12.7 trillion um, in resources. It's one of the largest coal deposits in the world. I think the second largest oil and gas field behind Norway, 117 of 120 um, of critical minerals. And similarly in China, you have Deng Xiaoping in the 90s who basically said they were going to have a critical mineral strategy and they would have complete ownership over rare earths. Um, that's made, meant they now have dominance in, in the supply chains of critical minerals. 90% uh, of rare earth refineries, 60% of rare earth supply. Um, we've been talking a lot about culture and identity, um, but I'm curious, as the way that international events play out, um, those geopolitical realities of resources, of wealth, of money, of oil, of coal, of food, um, how do those two dynamics play against each other and how is the West doing when it comes to playing real statecraft and recognising what we have to contribute both to the West but to the world more broadly with commodities and resources? Well, first of all, in geopolitics, I think for me it is undoubtedly the case that the fact that, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm embarrassed to be saying these trite and obvious things, but human beings have known for millennia that the way to prevent war is to be strong. Civis pacem, parabellum. And what the West has been doing for the last God knows how many years is signaling weakness mm -hmm. and division abroad. And it is therefore not a surprise to me when I see country after country that is allied to the United States be attacked or invaded. These things are not disconnected. So number one. And number two, uh, I'm afraid uh, there's a guy called Rob Henderson who came up with the phrase luxury beliefs. Uh, these ideas that are impractical and don't make any sense, but that make particularly our elites feel good. And uh, our approach to energy and climate and all of these things is an example of that, where we're basically we're putting a, a rope around our own necks so that we feel good about ourselves. It's a kind of weird fetish uh, that I don't really understand. Uh, and I think we're being punished for that. Um, we'll, we'd love to open up to the floor um, uh, in a couple of minutes, but just um, one final question from me um, before we circulate the mic. And do just stick your hand up. Um, if you've got a question, we'll get a mic out to you. Um, where, where, where do you think we're headed? What is the trajectory we're on, not just as Australia, but as the West more broadly? And probably more importantly, as part of the Western community, the civilization, what, what do we actually need to do, both politically, but also culturally, economically, um, socially, in order to get us back on a trajectory of hope, dynamism, and civilizational confidence in, in our societies? Well, I think in Australia, you're actually very well placed to resist this stuff, comparatively speaking, at least. Uh, number one, because you have time. This stuff that basically America exports to the rest of the world, I think it goes America, Britain, and then the rest of the Anglosphere. This disease, this mind virus, spreads to the English language. Uh, but I think you have a bit more time, so you're not as far down the slope, is what I see. I may be wrong about this. Uh, and you have the example, you know, we in Britain are giving you the example of what not to do, right? So on that front, I think you have a little bit more time. And what, what in terms of what you need to do, I mean, this is more, <coughs> look, for two or three generations, the children, our children in, in our societies have been taught to, an ideology that is hostile to the very foundations of our civilization. Uh, and this is what Orwell meant when he said, he who controls the past controls the future. So everything that's happening now should be absolutely no surprise to anybody. And so the answer is, I'm afraid, you have to start teaching your children the things that we've just been talking about. Why are you so safe? Why are you so prosperous? 
And when you think about messing around with the formula that made the West successful, do you think the West will remain successful? If you, if you want to divide people along race and, and sex and, and all of these things, let's look at history. Identitarianism and multi-ethnic societies, how does that usually work out? Mm. Not very well, I put it to you. Usually ends up bloodshed, right? Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I, my wife, uh, I always say, I don't know if you know this phrase, based. It's this idea that you're kind of aware of the stupidity of all, the, all these ideas. Uh, people always ask me about my wife. What does your wife think about what you do? And my wife is completely apolitical, but Eastern European, and so extremely based as a result. Right? <laughs> and so my wife and I are always looking at the world, and the one thing that she can never understand is human beings evolved for millennia for men and women to work together. And now, when you look at our culture, when you look at our media, when you look at our entertainment, men and women are being positioned as some kind of competitors in some battle of the sexes. Right? The same with ethnic groups, the same with, we're being de deliberately divided along lines of, along which we must never be divided if we're ever going to, to be successful. So, uh, the solution is to teach history properly. That means good and bad. But in context, I mean, in Britain we have this endless conversation about how evil Britain is because of slavery. And I almost think that if you, if you take away what people are saying, it sort of sounds a little bit like they think that what happened in the world was no one had slavery, then the British Empire came along, invented slavery, <laughs> practiced it, and then some other people came along and made the British Empire stop. That's what you would tell. I went to the Slavery Museum in Liverpool, right? And it's very good in terms of what happened, the tragic journey across the Atlantic, etc. Didn't tell you anything about how the slaves became slaves. Who captured them? Who sold them? Doesn't tell you anything about that. Doesn't tell you anything about the trans-Saharan slave trade, which was much worse, lasted for much longer, had a much higher death rate, etc., etc., etc. And so it seems to people sort of live in this world where they think, you know, in abstraction, the British Empire was this evil thing, as opposed to the truth, which is slavery was practiced everywhere. The Brits also practiced it, and then they ended it and spent a good amount of money and blood and treasure and lives to end it, including in other parts of the world, right? Uh, you've got to teach history properly, otherwise we're lost. Um, so it's about education, uh, and given that the people who are spreading this nonsense have control of many sections of the education system, it's probably going to start in the home more than anything. It's a, you know, I grew up in the Soviet Union. The first conversation I remember my parents having with me before I went to school was, do not repeat anything we say in the house outside. <laughs> and I'm afraid that's kind of where we're headed. And they're going to teach you this bullshit and this bullshit and this bullshit and this bullshit in school. Come home, tell us about it, we'll explain to you why none of it makes sense, why it's all nonsense. I'm afraid that's the position we're in now. You're going to have to take action at home with your little one. I hope he's listening. I apologize for using the bad language that I just did. Um, so uh, it is about, uh, I, hate to, I hesitate to use this phrase because of what's happened to, um, to, to, to the conversation around vaccine, but you have to vaccinate your children against this disease. Um, just, just one more quick question off the back of that. Um, the role of leadership as well in, in sort of setting our vision higher. And I'm conscious that you know the way that we talk about the West is this dynamic coalition building, land of free speech. That was again one with love and treasure, internal division, and, and a generation of leaders of character. Um, and what do you think it would take to, to get a generation of leaders of character and, and, and courage and confidence to to emerge? Is that something we just have to hope for, or, or are there things that we can all be doing in this room to make make that? Well, forgive me for putting it bluntly, but I just think more people need to strap on a pair. Yeah. I'm serious. I, I, I'm, I'm serious in politics and elsewhere. And, you know, people uh, who send the sensible left and the sensible right have to recognize that we are in a civilizational moment. And, you know, a, a, good, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Morris Glassman, who's a labor lord in, 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 um, in, in the... House of Lords in the UK. I mean, he always says, you know, if you go to the doctor and they say it's progressive, it's not good news, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have to recognize left and right, this is not progress. Yeah. This is not progress, and if it's not progress, and if it is destructive, and if it is a threat to our civilization, you have to do what that means you have to do, which is you have to stop caring what someone in the papers is going to write about you, and actually stand up and say, no, this is what we believe. 
And one of the things that people, I think, have made a mistake on when we come to these conversations is we keep accepting the progressive framing of every issue. For example, on freedom of expression, people will say, of course we've got to be concerned about the harm of blah, blah, blah. No, no, that's not the argument. The argument is freedom comes with a price, it's worth paying, now shut up. That's the argument. It's worth paying. Since Elon Musk has taken over Twitter, I get way more hate and racist and anti-Semitic abuse on Twitter. I don't care. It's worth it. Freedom is worth it. That's the argument we should be making. And not that I'm going, yeah, hate speech, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. We've got to start showing, if we want to teach people resilience, we've got to start demonstrating it. And so leadership is about leadership by example. We need more people, including in politics, to stop caring about what someone's going to say about them on social media, about the label that people are going to put on them, and start speaking directly to their electorate. And their electorate is up for it, as we've seen with various referenda and all sorts of other movements around the world. The people, the mainstream media is destroying their own credibility. They've been doing it for a long time. Their audience is aging out of existence. They're not as relevant as they used to be. And all the energy in new media is on our side of the conversation. So the more politicians and the more other leaders in other areas strap on a pair, the less of a problem it's gonna be. And it's gonna become contagious if people do that. Very well said. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Uh, one over the back left. Um, we'll get a mic over to you. If you've got a loud voice, we can jump straight in. I'll oh, stand up. Uh, just like briefly on the way in which sort of political ideology and negative policies are being exported, <coughs> are being exported from the US to the UK and to Australia. Do you think that the US is true? Do you think that if we were to have some sort of political reawakening in the US and policy would improve the other? Um, I, I, having been to the US, I, I wouldn't rely on that as the, as the solution because they're, they're not in a great place. I actually think it works the other way around potentially, which is in the UK and in Australia, we have an opportunity to create an alternative example. Um, and I see this in America. I mean, they are one of the reasons that the section of the sections of the American right, and Andrew Cunley referenced my article about what I call the woke right. One of the reasons that you know people like Tucker Carlson are increasingly tempted by the allure of Putinism, or there are elements of the American right that that are starting to um, you know pay extra attention to people like Nayib Bukele in El Salvador is they're looking for an alternative that solves some of these problems. Uh, I mean, uh, Bukele and Salvador basically came in, locked up all the gang members, and suddenly they went in a few years from being the most dangerous country in the world to the safest country in, in the Western Hemisphere. People are looking for solutions. So when you have politicians in Australia, uh, or in Canada, or in the UK, who are going to come out and actually lead an alternative to this and start to solve some of these problems. For example, you know, the transgender issue, We've made a lot of progress on pushing back against that in the UK, which is why everyone calls us Turf Island. But now people are paying attention to that in America and going, well, why can't we do this? So I think the opportunity for leadership exists everywhere. And in every country, people need to step, step up and start uh, recognizing that there's an opportunity here. And you guys are very well placed because you're nowhere near as split, you're nowhere near as power polarized, you're nowhere near as angry. Frankly, in a country that 60% of whatever of your economy relies on digging stuff out of the ground and shipping it, I just think this ideology is going to have less purchase because it's kind of hard to be woke down a mine. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and so you have an opportunity, I think, uh, to, to, to show the world a different, a different approach to many of these issues. Right? I wouldn't rely on America to do it because they're not in a good place. Yes. Just to... Oh, thanks for coming, it's been most informative. Just um, a little bit more prescriptive, not after names and addresses, but when you describe this battle as a Marxist thing, and um, some people just get caught up in the feel-good aspect of that, you then go, there's people behind this, though, who are even trying to bring down our civilization. Describe who those people are, and what are those people about? Where, where, where are they coming from? Well, I mean, Jonathan Haidt has written very persuasively about, in terms of what has happened to universities and the ratio of left versus right on the university campus. It went from like one to two or one to three to like one to a hundred. Uh, so the universities are increasingly leftist and uh, not just leftist, but particularly, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the left, but, but this particular ideology uh, is extremely widespread uh, in the education system. 
Uh, and then you look at any big social movement that comes from the progressive side. I mean, the BLM leaders are on camera saying we are trained Marxists. And everyone goes, oh, the BLM is... Maybe there's some good that they were trying to pursue, but these people are Marxists, right? So uh, this ideology is very, very common. And a lot of people, as I say, just well-intentioned people who've absorbed elements of this because they are... Look, the, the, I, the, there's a lot of truth to the idea that our societies historically are not perfect. I came to England in 1995. Uh, I went to school and you know, one of the first things someone said to me was, go back to Russia, you pack it. <laughs> I haven't spoken to that teacher since. Um, <laughs> worst geography teacher ever. Um, <laughs> we were, we had issues, and, and, and I'm sure there's, look, you're not going to legislate stupidity out of existence. It's not going to happen. So uh, they're using elements of reality, uh, and a lot of people will resonate because, you know, we are sympathetic and empathetic people. So how would you transform the universities? Well, as I say, uh, I think you have to, the first solution is, I, by the, look, if your kid is woke by the time he's got to university, it's probably too late at this point, right? So it starts with inoculating your children against this at the beginning. And then more people have to go into academia who are not aligned to this way of thinking. Uh, and there is pushback in the universities. I know a lot of people in the UK and elsewhere who are uh, not only starting to push back within the institutions, but they're creating their alternative. Now, it's not easy to create universities from scratch, but, but that's going to be an element of it too. Do you, do you, think, do you think that uh, uh, President Putin is trying to fulfill Mother Russia prophecy and trying to find meaning in history and their existence and trying to find a third way? Well, look, I don't know Vladimir Putin personally, as you can imagine, so I, I don't know exactly what's motivating him, but it strikes me that if you are the most powerful man in one of the biggest and most powerful countries in the world with nuclear weapons at your fingertips, you've been in power for 25 years, you have access to whatever material wishes and needs that a human being can fulfill, then, and you are getting on a bit, at that point, I do think your mind probably turns towards legacy. And... Uh, uh, I, I think it's. I don't think it's presumptuous to say that uh, Mr. Putin would like to be known as Vladimir the Great, and rebuilding the Russian Empire seems like a pretty good project to, towards that end. So, while the material concerns you mentioned earlier, are of course, going to be an impact, uh, an imp impactful. I imagine that personal psychology plays a role in all of this, and being seen as having taken Russia from a weak and divided and uh, you know, <coughs> genuinely victimized country, which is a tower, I think a lot of people would see the night, what happened in Russia in the 1990s, to a superpower that is now flexing its muscles around the world and recapturing, you know, Russian territory, as people would see. I mean, if you listen to his interview with Tucker Carlson, uh, the first 40 minutes is basically spent on a history lesson, and the history lesson, which actually Tucker did try to challenge him on, but not very effectively, is to justify recap this is our land is what he's saying uh so to be seen as um rebuilding the russian empire or elements of it or recapturing elements of it i'm sure is something that plays very much on on the kind of historical perspective that vladimir putin now clearly has i'm sorry he died about it the wrong way. why why is, why would you say he's going about it the wrong way because of his murderous um, I don't know. I, the, I, 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 I doubt that Vladimir Putin is concerned about the murderousness of what he's doing. Uh, former KGB colonel, I think he considers that um, a, a practical consideration like other resources you know you burn a bit of fuel here you spend a bit of money there you use a few troops here that's that's the way that uh, a russian leader will be thinking about it um so yeah i i look I, I i can't say whether he should have done it a different way or not but i i think his thinking will be this is the price we pay for the greatness of russia and for for, for recapturing our land
think an interesting example as well, when you talk about the difference between Western thought and having baked into the fabric of our institutions, the idea of the transcendent, the dignity of the individual, um, and that we do see human beings in a very different way, and, and that can trend to narcissistic individualism, but at its best, it means that we do have a respect for life, um, a, a dignity for all, and, and that we do have the capacity to have multi-ethnic societies that is cohesive, um, assuming that we do work together. Come over here to Teresa. Hi. Um, do you know of any good models of uh, getting back at the primary school level to the ideological way? Are there models like in the UK? And then my second question is, as a scientist now, I see a lot of research in different areas that is actually not good science, and that is creating a lot of ideological dissent and problems because people have always agreed with science is unbiased. How do we get around, get back to science being true science? How dare you question the science? <laughs> the science. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not a scientist, but I come from a family of my uh, scientists. My grandfather was an astrophysicist. Both my parents are biochemical engineers. And when they look at the way the word science is now being used, uh, I think they want to throw up, frankly. That, that, that's where we are. In terms of uh, successful models for, I don't know about primary. Um, and look, by the way, I, I, Let's be clear, I'm not suggesting that we should be going into primary schools and teaching about the Roman Empire and the glory of ancient Greece. It's probably a bit early. We probably shouldn't be them teaching them about victimhood either. It's more about values and that kind of approach. But there's a lady in the UK who is just a heroine, I think, for anyone who, who respects uh, teaching children resilience and, and all of these other things that we should be, which is Catherine Burble Singh and her Michaela School. Um, and she's an absolute model of how to do that. Um, and, and I hope more people around the world adopt that uh, message. But in terms of the science, look, I think we've got to be honest. I mean, Peter Thiel, uh, the American investor, he's talked a lot about the corruption in the science. And there are a lot of people in science now, as I understand it, whose primary job is not to research and to think, but to gain government grants. Uh, and so they're politicians with science degrees as opposed to actually in case, and look, science, the, the science has to stop discrediting itself um, on all sorts of issues uh, and has to have a little bit more humility. I mean, the, the climate conversation is one of the examples in which I think that's absolutely true because uh, modeling is being presented as science. And I think we've got to understand that there's a difference. If I pick up this glass and let it go to the floor, we have uh, formulas that tell us how that will happen. The idea that we know what will happen to a system as complex as the climate on the planet, uh, based on models alone, seems to me to be rather presumptuous, uh, and I think rightly needs to be questioned. I'm not, and by the way, I'm not a climate denier, nor am I a climate uh, catastrophist. I'm a climate pragmatist. I think we have to be pragmatic about that issue, um, and we we have too much dogmatism in our in our scientific. Uh, and other conversations now. Uh, we've got to remember that uh, we need space to question. Uh, what happened during COVID on that issue, to me, was just, uh, and frankly, an abomination, what happened in this country as well. I mean, I was watching what Dan Andrews was doing from afar, and uh, I, I couldn't believe what was happening, genuinely. Just on the models, Teresa, as well, there's um, great stuff coming out of Florida. Um, what the census is doing with education and, and also turning to the UK and I know they've recently enshrined protections for free speech in universities, the higher education bill um, and set up a free speech champion to, to look over some of these issues and especially when speakers are getting cancelled or, or students are protesting and trying to push out um, sort of heterodox ideas um, and also I know Miriam Cates is champion looking at that work in primary schools and having a clear definition of what is political content, what is ideology and actually saying no you can't be teaching this. This is that there are already impartiality laws in place, and making sure that they're enforced for um, you know edgy uh, cultural issues. Come over here, David. Yeah, uh, thanks. Fascinating uh, display of what's going on. But Australia does things differently, and we actually uh, got a dynamic. And I'm interested to hear the same in Britain. We have these pension funds called super funds. Uh, and they are dominated by the union control industry super which has given them uh, enormous power in the boardrooms and the top part of the economy. And they are actively pursuing shareholder um, activism and uh, not shareholder economic thinking, but uh, stakeholder and getting involved in all sorts of non-core issues in their uh, organisations. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a revelation because not only is 
things. Uh, just the Lord cadets in mm. Russia mm. who were bourgeoisie supporters of the communists. And, uh, but have you got that business uh, dynamic happening in Britain? Well, I think our pension system is different, uh, but do we have um, a lot of this ideology in our corporate world? Yes, and it's partly because of legislation. I mean, all of this diversity, equity, inclusion stuff is required uh, in some places in the US and in the UK. Um, and so one of, look, I don't think 50 something straight white male CEOs are particularly desperate to implement all this stuff, but they're fearful. Uh, part of it is because they have to comply with the law, and part of it is they sort of they don't want to be chastised by their grandchildren about how the the, the workplace is not diverse enough or whatever. Um, but there is there is some of that going on, and I think that's where it's very important not to allow your legislative um, your legislation to become polluted by these ideas, where it's actually being enforced on the corporate world. But how to solve that particular issue you're talking about is probably not something I can speak to with any of. Actually, we're going to be the demise of the mainstream media, and so there are alternative media sources that are rising up. Now, how do we use or how do we turn around that system to allow the, the majority of Australians, the silent majorities, to stand up against and push back away against the wokeism or the um, ideology that's been thrust upon us? I think it's already happening. I think it's a natural process. I think what's likely to come next is. Uh, we've seen a kind of fragmentation of the media space. So you used to have five newspapers or five news outlets or whatever, and now you have 500. Uh, eventually, what will happen with new media, I think, is consolidation, uh, because no one in this room is going to give $5 a month to their favorite 30 podcasts. The admin alone will kill you. So um, you're going to want to hear from uh, the people that you want to hear from, under perhaps one umbrella, and the Daily Wire, which is an American conservative uh, group, uh, you know, they've shown kind of the model for that. You bring a few content creators under one umbrella. Um, so I think that's probably what will happen, and therefore the power of those individual media groups, the media empires of the future, if you like, uh, is going to grow as they consolidate. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent, obviously, for, for personal reasons of, of what's happening in new media, although I have to say, there's a very important role for the mainstream media. Uh, and I'm not someone who, who enjoys or welcomes the destruction that we're seeing. I think the mainstream media uh, have, have undermined their own credibility and it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. What's happening is there's a fragmentation of reality to the point where it's very difficult for people to agree on what the truth is anymore. And that's a bad place to be. It's a bad place to be. So I think what, what I would like to see is the mainstream media recognize the mistakes that they've been making and to start learning from new media. And I would love nothing more than for you know, the BBC and various publications in the UK and ABC and whoever here to start to do better work and take, take away from what I'm doing. That, that's great, I'll go back to doing comedy or, or, or doing nothing or whatever. Like, I am the turkey that would vote for Christmas. I would love to never ever have to talk about work with this ever again. Um, so, uh, I think we need a healthy media ecosystem. The new media is forcing the old media to adjust. Um, but, as we've seen on, in politics too, the, 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 the elite that has power and control is desperate not to change anything. You know, this is why I keep saying to my friends who are like, well, Donald Trump is really obnoxious. Yes, imagine how desperate the American public had to be to elect him, right? Think about Brexit. Brexit is exactly the same thing. Most of the people who voted for Brexit were not necessarily thinking of EU regulations when they did it, right? They felt that they had to let the elite know that we're going in the wrong direction on all sorts of issues. What did the elite do on both those issues? Oh, it's Russia collusion. Oh, it's the Russians that did Brexit. I, keep saying to, I kept saying to people, if the Russians had done Brexit, it'd be done by now, you know? <laughs> But they invent all these conspiracy theories that justify keeping power and not changing their approach. And it's a very dangerous place to be. It's a very, that's why you're seeing the populist movements around the West. Constantine, you spoke about the concept of luxury beliefs. Mm. An example of which is this idea of decluttering beliefs. A lot of people who describe that <coughs> view think that they're pushing back against beliefs and they're actually back to the concept as the most detrimental impact on the communities who would need advice. Mm. Um, it's easy to put that down to uh, perhaps a 
perhaps a lack of self-awareness, but my question to you would be, what do you think he is, and how could we eliminate those attitudes? Well, on that issue specifically, if you think about what Marxism is predicated on from the beginning, it's predicated on a blank slate view of the world. And Marxists, at, at the extreme ends of that ideology, what they believe is that human beings who commit crime, for example, could only possibly be committing crime because of the circumstances in which they exist. Nobody is a criminal. They are made a criminal by the circumstances of their life, uh, by the fact that they were poor or uh, badly treated or whatever. Um, and so, at the extreme edges of that ideology, they believe that prisons are unnecessary because if we had the right society and if we treated everybody well, there would be no crime and there would be no criminals and therefore we wouldn't need the police. Um, sadly, that's not true. Um, and so, this, it, it's this kind of utopianism that produces this idea. And of course, this is one of the, the biggest <laughs> irritations for me. The people like me who are challenging some of the stuff are constantly being presented as being insensitive to the plight of minorities, when it is those very minorities that oppose this nonsense the most. Because they are the ones that have to live in communities <laughs> where the police are necessary, and they know that the police are there because that's where the crime is, right? So uh, these are luxury beliefs, and I, the, I think, <laughs> frankly, the, 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 these Marxists are doing the job for us by making those communities worse. And that, I think, is a wake-up call for a lot of people. Thanks uh, so much for your presentation. So it seems that the progressive left has largely succeeded in this project of cultural agenda, like Gradsky's political vision, but it strikes me that that hasn't been a sort of a conscious design to throw up with a whole lot of individual decisions about who goes into academia, who becomes a public broadcaster, who becomes a teacher, and the truth is now that there's quite a homogenous group of people mm -hmm. in these sorts of thought leadership institutions. I mean, how do we reverse that? Because we're very focused, including in this building, on top-down, system-based legislative solutions, but a lot of it is just the product of you know, the, the political worldview of the people who occupy the institutions at the moment. Well, right, and there's this meme about uh, that I, I love, which is, uh, you know, the <coughs> progressives want to take over your life, and, and the people, the conservatives just want to grill, you know, they want to have their barbecues and be left alone. And in the battle of people who want to control everything about you and people who just want to be left alone, the people who want to control your life are usually going to win. Um, but I think if, you, if we look at the evidence in terms of public perception of all of these issues, um, I think the public are broadly on our side of the conversation in terms of statistic, numerically speaking. So it's a question of how do you channel that sentiment into political media and other tangible outcomes. Um, and, and you are starting to see that. In the UK, it's very difficult because we have a first-past-the-post system, uh, which means that having a new party come along that, that channels this, these concerns is a little bit difficult. Uh, but I think we are starting to see some of that pushback taking shape um, in terms of the emergence of uh, media organizations and platforms and politicians who are gathering popularity by speaking about these issues. Um, and if we, if we continue to put that pressure on, there is a chance that we might succeed. It strikes me that if we're in the midst of a culture war, then we need to be making culture and not just complaining. Um, one last question um, before we... Uh, sorry, one here and then, and then we'll have to wrap up in a second. Chris, I wonder what you make out of the alliance between fundamentalist Islamic groups and the left. We talked about Marxism, but it seems on the face of it that this is at one level an unholy alliance, but at another level it is the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and it's even created a climate of fear that has crept into places like the House of Commons, and we've seen that play out in the explanatory statement by the Speaker recently that he feared for the lives of parliamentarians, and that's why he made a set of decisions which have caused some controversy. Mm. That's a recipe for paralysis. Just your view. Well, uh, I agree. We, we just had uh, Sir Labravman, the former Home Secretary, uh, on our show, and I agree with her that, that what that instance you're talking about in Parliament represented is that uh, Islamists are able to dictate. I mean, what they did is they forced the British Parliament to abandon its own procedures under threats of violence. Now, it's obviously inc incredibly dangerous. As for the alliance you're talking about, uh, I mean, I think it's fair to say that. Uh, 
I can put this gently. The phenomenon of queers for Palestine uh, is an interesting one to me. Uh, and it shows the ignorance of those people uh, and the willingness of the Islamists to use those people for their own end. Um, because, again, the oppressor-oppressed dynamic comes into play. So Muslims are considered oppressed and therefore we must feel uh, some kind of extra empathy for them in that situation. Um, this will not end well. Constantine, when you're no longer talking about woke, because all of these issues have, have seen the sunset, and we are once again a, a free and, and mighty nation and civilization, what are you going to be talking about? Uh, nothing. Uh, I, I, I actually much prefer listening than talking. Uh, I love interviewing people, and there are so many conversations that we've yet to have on our show with people who've been successes in the world of sport, business, science, uh, people who've had extraordinary journeys, people who, whose values are worth talking about. How do you overcome tragedy and resilience? How do you deal with setbacks? Uh, all of these things, you know, what, what a great life you've led. And these are all comments. I'm very interested, I'm curious intellectually and in other ways about people. So uh, I define my success in this conversation by the ability to know how to talk about it anything anymore and actually just listen. We'll, we'll let you stop talking there. Can we thank Constantine. Thank you very much.